Uh, hello everyone. So good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on your location. Um, and so first I just want to begin by saying I'm really excited to be here um, and I want to take a moment to thank all the organizers um, for making this possible. So thank you. And if you attended the Azure Stack HCI day last year, uh, many of you might remember me from a Dispeed session. Um, but if not, um, I'm back again to talk to you a bit more about performance tools and can't believe it's already been one year already. Um, but if anyone hasn't met me, uh, my name is Jason. I'm a program manager on the Edge and Platform team, and I work on performance and partially on sizing scenarios as well. So today, um, I know some of you really care about performance, and so what I'd like to do for today's session is introduce a pretty big update. Uh, more specifically, excited to announce uh, VMFleet 2.0, which involves uh, the new changes to both DiskSpeed and VMFleet. So let's dive into it. So before getting any deeper, I want to quickly highlight a few of the topics for today. First, we'll be discussing the most important thing. Um, what are the new changes in VMFleet? And then we'll go over some quick examples as well. And then second, we'll also discuss a new test mechanism in the form of a commandlet with the goal to provide more guidance. And then we'll go over a quick demo and proceed to discuss what's next on the future roadmap. So many performance tools often reach the end of their lifespan. Fortunately, Microsoft still loves Azure Stack HCI performance, which is why this speed and VMFleet is here to stay. And for those of you who might not be familiar with VMFleet, it was originally a collection of scripts that helped deploy virtual machines and use this speed to perform IO to stress the storage system and often used as a performance benchmarking test. So what does VMFleet 2.0 bring? Well, first, it's the biggest VMFleet update in over three years, um, has been quite a while. And second, previously there was admittedly a bit of a learning curve. So if you are a first time user or if you even take a break from using the tool, it's pretty easy to forget how to deploy, utilize, and measure results using VMFleet. Not to mention it's always been a bit tedious to deploy the tool in the first place. A lot of manually moving files around, and even after deploying, there's a bunch of scripts. Um, which one do you run first? All of these questions. Therefore, we decided to make this process a bit more easier and intuitive for all users. And the third thing is that VMFleet 2.0 introduces more powerful ways to simulate workloads. And this includes um, new disk speed flags and parameters as well. So the first thing, given that this is the biggest update in three years, you might be wondering how different is it from VMFleet 1.0? Is it a complete revamp? Well, luckily it's still your familiar and reliable VMFleet tool. Um, and most of the original functionalities are still there, meaning that you can run a VMFleet test with disk speed commands, open up watch cluster to see the IOPS, graph polynomial fits if needed, and your familiar folder structure is there as well. And all of this is still fully open source on GitHub. So the VMFleet 1.0 scripts and the VMFleet 2.0 module will be live on the GitHub repo. Uh, so if for some reason you still want to use VMFleet 1.0, it's still right there for you. Or if you want to take a look at the 2.0 scripts, you can also do so as well. So I'd say the main physical change to VMFleet is that it's now a PowerShell module, so you no longer need to manually download the scripts, and the deployment process is much, and I mean much faster. And I also want to assure you that this speed is still backwards compatible from HCI v2 all the way to Windows Server 2008 R2. So on that note, in the past there were quite a few steps to deploy. Um, first, you need to create a collect volume, and then a cluster shared volume per node, and then you need to obtain a server core image, navigate to GitHub, download the repository, download the executable separately, a bunch of manual steps. In addition, you also need to move the executable point to the right folder, move the VSDX into the, a selected folder, and turn off the CSV cache, create a fleet of VMs using a script, and set the appropriate VM characteristics like memory. And then at this point, you can finally begin running the scripts but there are multiple entry points and it seems to be like there's multiple ways to do this. So for example, you can start modifying the run.ps1 script directly and uh, run the clear pause script to get started, or you can start running the start sweep script uh, with parameters. And as you can see, there's multiple ways to run this and quite a few steps. So what changed? 
Well, the PowerShell module will automate a few things. First, uh, you, do, you still do need to perform a few of the same prerequisite steps. So this is like creating a collect volume, creating a CSV per node, installing a server core VHDX image, etc. But now all you need to do is install and import the VM fleet module. And then you can run install fleet to install the or create the familiar folder directory structure and you're pretty much done. And this also does a few other things like pre-installing the dispute executable, turning the CSV cache off, etc. And the last step is simply running new fleet in order to create your virtual machines. And this will by default create the number of VMs equal to the number of physical cores, unless specified otherwise. And then you can start running your other commandlets to begin your testing experience, like start sweep. And as you can see, it's uh, much simpler and it really is just running a series of commandlets. So next, I want to introduce some of the more new features and commands that lets you simulate workloads with more control. To improve VM fleet, we also wanted to improve disk speed, and we're also fully aware that disk speed uh, is lacking in certain aspects compared to other tools out in the world. But with this most recent update, I think that disk speed in VM fleet takes a leap forward by offering more functionality and granular control. So first, we can now simulate a hot coal working set. So previously, 100% of the I.O. generated by disk speed was uniformly dis distributed across the target file, which results in a performance boost to more compared to more realistic workloads where data might be split between hot and cold working sets. So in order to offer this more flexibility and simulate these re realistic workloads, disk speed now allows you to specify a non-uniform distribution for random I.O. in the target file. And this can be specified in two ways, either a percentage based distribution or an absolute based distribution, as denoted here by RDPCT and RDABS. So for example, if you wanted to, if you want a percentage based specification, then you can specify that you want to send 50% of the IO to only 20% of the target file. Or if you want an absolute size based specification, then you can specify that you want to send 50% of the IO to only two gigabytes of the 10 gigabyte target file. Also, if you specify an IO distribution percentage of zero, that indicates a whole or meaning that no IO will be issued to that range of the target file. Second, you can mix random and sequential workloads in one test run. So previously, this speed could only run 100% random or 100% sequential workloads. Now you can specify a percentage of IO requests that can be issued randomly with respect to the last issued IO. And this is denoted by RS. Third, this speed has a new parameter called RP, and that lets you provide your desired parameters and create an XML profile without running your disk speed load. This way you can save your profile and use it later or use this to automate certain workloads. Next, we heard a lot of feedback regarding the only, that the only way to throttle IOPS was to use the G flag, which is unfortunately a throughput specification. And this means that you need to calculate and reason about the relationship between throughput, which is in bytes per millisecond, and IOPS in order to thr throttle the IOPS to a desired value. But those days are long gone, as you can use a new flag called GI, and that lets you directly control the IOPS limit. And last but not least, if you decide to create an XML profile with two target files, you can use the star number as a generic placeholder for each target. Later, if you decide to run the XML profile but want to overwrite and replace the two target files to something else that you want, then you can do so. So there's a lot of new changes, and I'm sure there's many questions, but uh, once you have a chance to test it, uh, I promise it'll make a lot more sense. But in the meantime, uh, we can go through a couple examples. So first, uh, the first thing, the first example is using this set of parameters. And the first thing we need to look at is where we have a 30% write ratio and we're using the random distribution based on absolute terms. And we also have a 40% random workload against a 10 gigabyte target file. So the first thing we will look at in this case would be the random distribution in terms of absolute value. 
And that means that 30% of the IO goes to five gigabytes of the target file, and 70% of the IO goes to the other five gigabyte of the target file. And then within those distributions, the IO is further categorized. Because of our W30 parameter, it specifies that within the hot call data split, 70% of the IO is read, 30% of the IO is write. And then because of our RS40 parameter, it specifies that within the read write IO, 40% of the IO is random and 60% of the IO is sequential. And I just want to quickly note that if the RS parameter is used in conjunction with the write ratio parameter, then the IO will be uh, homogeneous, the sequential IO will be homogeneous in the sense that uh, whenever it is sequential IO, it'll be all writes or all writes or all uh, reads. So in general, as you can see, these parameters, uh, you can view these parameters as kind of categorizing IO to a nested structure. So we have a couple more examples for other new flags as well, and it's a bit more simpler, um, but so bear with me. Uh, the next example is for creating parameter profiles. So if you want to create a new parameter profile, you can do so by simply specifying your normal flags plus the RP XML flag and pipe it into a new XML file. The resulting profile should look something like these two images. And there's really nothing new here, um, as this also existed in the previous disk speed and VM fleet versions, and it really does serve as the backbone for disk speed. The only thing new is that you can easily save this profile via command line, as opposed to manually opening them, opening the XML files and copying the profile tag section. So the next example is for the direct IOPS limiter. And this one is as simple as it sounds. Let's say you want to limit IOPS to 1000 per thread, then previously you needed to use the G flag and specify 4100 bytes per millisecond for a 4K block size. But now you don't need to really figure out that you know 1000 IOPS is 4100 bytes per millisecond. You can just simply use the GI flag and simply write 1000 and that's it. So the next example is for replacing target files in the XML profile. So let's say that I want to send IO to two target files in the future. Then I can initially create the profile with two target templates by specifying star one and star two. Later, when I run the profile, all I need to do is specify the new target files such as io.dat and io2.dat. And I'll note here that you will run into an error for three types of scenarios. If number one, you don't, you provide too many target files as opposed to what you define. So if the target profile targets two test files, but when you're rerunning the test, you only provide one, then you'll run into an error. And the same thing will occur if you provide none. And third, it'll you'll also run into an error if you provide too many target files. So if we define two here, but you decide to provide three target files, then you will run into an error. So we just covered a few disk speed updates. Next up, I want to cover a few VM fleet updates. The first new feature I'd like to introduce is the ability to specify a percentage of VMs that can now be misaligned from the owner node. In other words, VMs will be rotated to other nodes. And this is denoted by the move fleet command. Previously, VM fleet denoted and deployed an even number of VMs per node, which are by default co-located with the owner node. And this would inevitably slightly increase the performance. Uh, the problem here is that in a more realistic world scenario, there may have been cases where the VMs are slightly misaligned from the owner node, which does affect performance. So you can now specify a percentage of VMs that can be rotated to be misaligned. The second uh, new feature is that VM fleet now lets you create an additional data disk on a virtual machine in addition to the default OS disk. This is this is just a new flag that is called data disk size uh, inside the set fleet command, which originally allows you to change the virtual machine characteristics like memory and vCPU, etc. So third, we have a new set of commandlets that actually allows you to check the virtual machine's health status and one of the more notable ones is repair fleet, which automatically restarts the virtual machines that are not responding to any pause and go actions. 
And finally, we have the get fleet volume estimate, which actually helps you estimate and calculate a cluster share volume size that you should create before running a VM fleet test. Um, and this command will estimate the CSV size for each resiliency type depending on your, your environment. So whether you have two nodes or three nodes, et cetera. In regards to estimating the CSV size, it should look something like this. And for context, this is on a four node cluster. So running this command will automatically generate these calculations and mirror will refer to three way mirrored here because uh, your system is a four node count and map will refer to the mirror accelerated parity. Now, if this was a two node system, then it would show different values such as a two way mirrored and a nested two way mirrored and a nested map resiliency type. So it really is dynamic in the sense uh, that it depends, the output depends on what environment that you have. So if you're curious about how these calculations are done, uh, we'll be releasing more detailed blogs and articles, et cetera. But what we're essentially just doing is first, uh, we calculate the reserve size by Microsoft's guidance, which is just one capacity drive per node up until four total drives and then we calculate the raw available size, and that depends on the raw size of the pool, minusing the cluster proof history, reserve size, and collect volume if you have it. And then we calculate the raw CSV size per node, which is just the raw size divided by node count, and then eventually calculate the logical CSV size per node, which is the raw CSV size per node times the storage efficiency percentage. So in addition to these updates, there's actually one more update uh, that I believe deserves its own stage. And this is the measure fleet core, core workload commandlet. So previously, VM fleet provided relatively little guidance as to which parameters or flags that one should use to mimic certain workloads, which is why uh, I want to introduce this new command, measure fleet core workload, and this command runs four predefined workloads, a general, a peak, VDI, and SQL workload. And these workloads are defined using disk speed flags and stored as an XML profile. So for general, peak, and VDI workloads, we deploy one VM per physical core, each containing one vCPU, and SQL uses one fourth of that VM count that the others use, but each VM contains four vCPUs. And after the test completes running, it generates a zip file that contains the IOPS results for each workload. So if you start running the command, you should see something like this. And then after the load completes, you should see a zip file that contains the following files. Now, all the gibberish names on the top uh, is called a run label. And each of these admittedly cryptically named folders represents a single workload sweep or test. So within each folder actually contains the XML and perfmon output files for each VM in your environment. So if you have 10 VMs, then you will have 10 output files. The file named uh, core workload is a log file that records what occurs during the measure fleet core, work, fleet core workload run. So you can refer to this if any issues occur during the run. And then the file that starts with help test. That's the output from actually another commandlet called get SDC diagnostic info, uh, which isn't really part of VM fleet, but gets your health information about your environment. So we collect this just in case that you need to refer to these for any issues that might pop up or for any triaging issues. And if you were ever wondering how could you ever match these cryptic run labels to a workload type. So for example, how do you know the first one, 9FF6, et cetera, refers to, let's say, a VDI workload? Well, don't worry, because there's a file called result log that contains the nomenclature mapping between the run label and the workload type. And finally, we have the result.csv file, and this is the aggregated VM fleet data set that you should mainly be interested in. It contains the IOPS, CPU, latency, and all of those relationships across all the virtual machines aggregated into one place. So let's quickly take a look inside some of the result files. Uh, so inside the result log file, 
as I've mentioned, it should contain the mapping between the run label and the workload type. It also contains some of the other characteristics like the Azure VM compute template used, the data disk size, memory, and VM alignment percentage. And you'll also notice that while measure fleet core workload mainly runs the four workloads, in reality, it's more than just four. It actually runs different variations for each of them. So for example, a VDI and SQL workload is ran twice, once with the VMs fully aligned and once with the VMs slightly misaligned. And in this case, it's 70% of the VMs are aligned. And the general workload actually undergoes even more than that, where we measure a general workload for different write ratios for 0, 10, and 30. So inside the result.tsv file, you should see a ton of data. There are multiple columns. There are multiple columns that VMfleet captures, such as the run label, the workload type, memory per VM, IOPS, etc. But what you're likely interested in is probably probably going to be the IOPS, workload type, CPU, and latency usage. And if you take a closer look at the IOPS column, you will notice that the values are quite large. And this is because it denotes the total IOPS values across all the virtual machines in the cluster for that workload test. So basically, IOPS column equals the quality of service per VM times the VM count. Regardless, there's a ton of data here for you to parse and play with, and there will be separate blog articles and documentations that go that really go into the detail of what each of these columns capture. So you can definitely look forward to that. So running Measure Fleet Core, work, core Workload for all four workloads is really a good way to get insights into your environment and how your environment behaves for different workload types or if you're just looking for some soft guidance on where to begin. However, I do wanna note that this command does take a while to finish on the line of a few hours. So if you are interested in running only one workload type like SQL, then you can extract the XML profile for an SQL workload and run that separately on your own, uh, which will definitely be a lot faster than this. And for the purpose of this presentation, I am going to display the following workload definitions. And these are also inside the PowerShell module scripts, so you'll also have access to these. So to give a little bit of context here, the first workload is the general workload. And this is a single threaded, high queue depth, and an unbuffered write through workload against a single target template. The, the second workload is peak, and the goal of this workload is to simply max out the IOPS values without any regards to latency, CPU, or any other limitations. This will serve as your hero number. And the third workload is the VDI, um, and many folks are probably familiar here. Um, this workload seeks to simulate a traditional virtual desktop infrastructure uh, where you might be hosting desktop environments. And this workload is defined by running IO against two targets, which happen in sequential order. The last workload is SQL, and this workload seeks to simulate data processing that is focused on transaction-oriented tasks, where the database receives both requests for data and changes to the data from multiple users. And this workload is defined by running I.O. against two targets again, which happens in sequential order. So I won't go into every single one of these, but uh, let's take VDI workload for an example. So it involves two targets. The right target is defined by um, a duration of five minutes. Uh, the, it has one thread count, um, a queue depth of eight, and the block size of 32. Um, and the first target, of course, is 100% right, whereas the second target is 100% read. And we actually limited this uh, to six IOPS per thread, as usually there's not much activity going on for a, VA, uh, for a VDI workload. And then the workload consists of 20% uh, random and 80% sequential, at least for the right component. And we'll see that we're using the RDPCT uh, parameter here, where it means that 95% of the IO will be sent to 5% of the target file, 4% of the IO will be sent to 10% of the target file, and the 1% of IO will be sent to 85% of the target file. And that last portion is actually implied if you don't, I guess, if you don't explicitly specify. <laughs> 
And of course, the Z parameter is just a way to make sure that we actually nerf the benefits that we get from compression dedupe um, in order to more fairly compare SSD, SSDs across companies as some do come in with built-in compression. And the last F is to determine that we only use the first 10 gigabytes of the target file. And for the read component, it's pretty much the same thing, uh, same parameters, except the values are slightly different. So for example, RS is 80, so 80% 80 random, 20% sequential, et cetera. Now I'm sure there's multiple opinions and perspectives on how these workloads can be defined. And we fully realize that it's incredibly difficult to actually categorize these workloads like this, um, as it really does depend on your use case and your environment. And the way that we came to define these parameters really just stems from what we observe in customer environments and how other performance tools categorize their workloads. Which is why we are looking for feedback and so definitely go try it and feel free to let us know your feedback as it will shape the future of these workloads. And I think one way to think about this is that we fully realize that these workload definitions are still very flimsy, meaning that they definitely don't represent an actual SQL or VDI workload, but with this, we did take a step closer at mimicking a more realistic workload. And if this was depicted on a spectrum, you can imagine that VMFleet 2.0 being smack in the middle with a measured fleet core workload. And the spectrum of measuring performance data seems to go from one, looking at a previous environment and guessing in your head that an SQL workload runs about X IOPS at Y latency, et cetera, um, not very rigorous. And two, using a benchmarking tool like Dispeed and inputting your own parameters, which in reality won't be a real workload. And third, it's uh, similar to the second point, which is just running a predefined workload like VM Fleet 2.0, which is by no means perfect, but offers some guidance and a baseline for you to observe data. And four, using a workload specific tool like HammerDB for SQL workloads as they are likely optimized for that scenario. Lastly, you have running an actual real life workload. And currently it's near impossible to get to the far right side as nothing can really beat a real workload, a real production level workload. And with this, I think, but with this, I think we did take a step closer. Um, so I do want to just acknowledge and not dismiss the fact that this is by no means perfect and it is definitely not the one all be all. So now let's actually get to the actual demos. But as a quick caveat, we won't be covering all the different individual updates in these demos as there are quite a ton of new minor feature updates as well. But there are a few major ones that uh, we should focus on. But um, you know, don't worry as we'll be releasing a lot of articles and documentations that detail each of them. So for the disk speed demo, we'll be running this set of parameters, and most of these are the same flags that were available before. Um, the only new ones that we should focus on are highlighted in blue, which is really the RDABS, the RS, and the GI. So the first demo that we have prepared is for disk speed, and most of these should be familiar. Um, so the, you know, um, again, focus on the last three parameters. Um, so as we begin, I will first show you an example of using the old G parameter to throttle IOPS and how cumbersome it was. Um, so we'll try to throttle it to 1000 IOPS. And you'll notice that I have something open on my left. And this is just a quick calculator script that uh, converts the throughput values in bytes per millisecond to IO per second. And then afterwards, I will show you an example with our new parameters. So as you can see, I'm running through a bunch of throughput values to find my 1000 IOPS. First, I try 4,500, 4,400, and eventually find that 4,100 bytes per millisecond results in 1,000 IOPS. So using this value, we'll run this speed. And you'll notice that um, we have throttled IOPS to 1,000, but that required a bit of effort, not to mention you can't even mix random sequential workloads or hot cold data. Now let's run this speed with our new parameters, including the GI throttle parameter. And this time, no need for a calculator, just input 1,000. And you'll notice that we again successfully throttled IOPS to around 1000. And if you look at the input profile, you'll notice that we ran the test with mixed random and sequential workloads. The block size is also displayed in kilobytes, not plain bytes any, anymore for readability. And then you'll also see the IO distribution, which determines our hot cold data. 
And you can also see the effective IO distribution, but in this case, it's the same as the previous. So the next demo that we have is for the PowerShell version of VM Fleet. And this demo will assume you already installed the module. And working under that assumption, you can begin by importing the module. And you can also check what functions you have. And then you can create one CSV per node as usual. And you can't forget creating the collect CSV. And then you can just go ahead and install the VM fleet directory and mount point by running install fleet. And then as usual, you do need a VHDX. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move it into the tools folder. And if we check the tools directory, you'll notice that the VHDX is there, but also that the disk speed executable is there as well, which was installed when you ran install fleet. And then you can create your VMs with new fleet. And by default, again, it just creates the number of VMs equal to the number of physical cores. Um, so uh, and in this case, I'm doing the same. And this step does take a bit of time. Um, so I will eventually speed up the demo in a bit. But in the meantime, I'll also take a look inside the folder structure to ensure that we still have the familiarity. So the control contains the master script automatically pushed when you install the fleet. Flag contains the pause and go flag sent to the VMs, and the result is where your result files will land. And the tools is what we saw before with the speed and the VHDX. And now I'm going to speed up the demo a bit. And then now this is the optional step. You can run set fleet to again change your memory or vCPU count, etc., as you wish. And of course, you can't forget running watch cluster as that will allow us to see the IOPS. And then you can start the VM fleet. And at this point, you're essentially pretty much done. Um, and you can run other commandlet functionalities as you wish or explore some of the other functionalities there. Uh, but you'll see the VMs coming alive and you'll see the IOPS briefly going up for a moment as the VMs are coming online. So we covered a lot today from disk speed updates to VM fleet, and we really only scratched the surface as there are uh, many, many more uh, minor features in VM fleet 2.0. So let's just recap some of the things that we talked about today. VM fleet 2.0 is one of the biggest updates in three years, and it still maintains your familiar structure, still fully open source, um, but now it's in a PowerShell module form. In addition, we made it so that it's much easier to deploy with automated installation steps and predefined workloads as a way to give some guidance as well. And finally, we touched upon all the new ways to simulate more realistic workloads, such as mixing random and sequential workloads. But remember, this isn't all, and there will be, there actually is a blog article that was launched uh, yesterday and there will be future articles and documentations that highlight each of these um, new features. So with that in mind, what's next? VM Fleet 2.0 is open for the public to use for your benchmarking needs, but you might also be wondering if we, Microsoft, is doing anything with the new VM Fleet tool. Well, I'll give you a quick, quick or a slight glimpse or tease into what we're trying to do with the new VM Fleet tool. As you might know, many customers struggle to size an HCI solution for IOPS performance. Therefore, based on feedback, we're planning and currently actually using this tool to gather some data and eventually build a pre predictive model and incorporate that into our new sizer that is coming later this fall. However, IOPS sizing will be coming a little bit later than the first iteration. Um, so in the first iteration, it will mainly be for storage, memory, and compute. And in the end, we'll be using this newly improved VM fleet data to build a model and be able to eventually size for IOPS performance and help customers during their HCI purchasing journey. So that's a quick glimpse at what's coming in the future. And with that, it pretty much wraps up my session for today. Um, all that I ask is if you are interested in performance benchmarking, then please go to this link and try VMFleet 2.0 and let us know if you have any feedback by emailing us at this email address.
And I think that's pretty much it. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today. And uh, thank you again, Karsten and everyone else for organizing this event. And I will pass it back to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jason. That was a very, very good presentation. And I like I liked a lot what I have seen. I have one question. Um, uh, you know, I do VM fleet in every cluster installation we do, and even if I when I train people, we we do the old one. I will do the new one, of course. Um, but with the old one, if you have a stretch cluster in Azure Azure Stack HCI, it also deploys VMs on the log CSVs. So I wonder if you know that, and if it's maybe prevented in the VM fleet 2.0. Yeah. So there's. Even in the old version, to my knowledge, there is no limitations on stretch clusters. Um, so I, I actually personally am not aware of this fact. However, the VMFleet 2.0 actually uses the same uh, underlying infrastructure as it. It simply adds more uh, commands and functionalities. So I'm assuming that it would actually have the same effect, and which is actually great to hear this feedback since we should definitely look into uh, making sure that it's guaranteed for stretch clusters. Yeah, it's it's not really a huge problem, but it's uh, the the volumes have the same name. They start with a with a host name minus lock, and uh, VMfleet also deploys VMs there, and you have to clean it up, of course, and uh, remove them. It would be great if it finds a volume minus lock, not using it. Uh, uh, only. Only asking for that. Otherwise, it works fine with a stretch cluster, and I I use it to even simulate some workload or so on. That's a great tool. Yeah. Okay, we haven't had any questions from the audience, so you were uh, or oh yeah, there is one. There's one. Ben is asking: Are there any plans to add CSV creation as an optional switch to install v fleet? Yeah, that's actually a good question because it is something that we actually were considering during this VMFlu 2.0. Um, so I'm assuming the question is specifying uh, kind of pre-creating a CSV volume before running VMFlu. Um, and if that is correct, uh, we actually have a new commandlet that lets you, uh, I believe it's called get fleet estimate uh, volume estimate, and it lets you estimate the uh, CSV volume size. And so you can use that direct. You can use that specific volume size that appears on the output, and use that to create your uh, cluster shared volume before running VMfleet. In regards to actually making that pipeline even more seamless and actually um, pre-defining it and actually creating the CSV even before running VMfleet, we that is actually within our backlog of things to do right now. Um, but in the meantime, you can definitely use the get fleet volume estimate, and it'll tell you the CSV size that you should create. And all you need to do is run the new volume commandlet with that size. Very cool. So, um, uh, so here is uh, here is um, how you call it, loop. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you have a very great feedback for you. Sage. Yeah, Jason, this was the best presentation so far. Excellent work on the new VM fleet. Thank you. Yeah, um, and definitely encourage everyone to try it out and provide feedback at the uh, email address right here, and we'll definitely take the feedback into account. Yeah, there's another one from Ben. Now, now the question starts: If it would be great if VMfleet dynamically creates the volumes as as part of the test rather than a manual step. Okay, another input about the volumes. <laughs> another okay. right. I, I can also add to this, right? Uh, I I wrote a script for the MS Labs that will prepare everything for you. It's like a helper script. It's in the tools. If you go to MS Lab site, there's a folder tools and there's like a prepare VM fleet or something like that. It will basically, if you run it, it will ask you for the S2D cluster. It will point you to the cluster and it will create volumes. And it will also ask you for the file with your server core. If you don't have any, you will just put it ISO file and it will create your uh, your uh, VHD that has uh, the things, you know, like an answer file included. So you can specify the password for the machine and it will also create the folders. So you don't have to manually go and prep your machine, right? And Carsten, by the way, you don't have to, 
uh, have the V disks names like that if you don't create it with a with uh, <laughs> with the Windows Admin Center. If you do it with the PowerShell, you can specify whatever log disk name you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know that, but uh, OK. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think I'll also add that I, I think eventually um, the roadmap for VM fleet is to the, I, I believe I showed a prerequisite step in the beginning for VM fleet 2.0. I think the final goal is to really automate all of that process into just one command line, for example, where it creates the collect volume for you, creates the CSV per node and it maybe even helps you install and get the server core image as well. Uh, so that that's definitely good feedback, and it's definitely something we want to aim towards. Yeah. But, so actually, uh, Yaromir, you have something yeah, to add? Yeah, I have also one question. Right? Is it possible to run the 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 watch cluster with the parameter cluster name, so you can watch cluster remotely, like a remote cluster, or is it possible to run VM fleet against the cluster, so you don't have to run for actually from the VM fleet machine, from the cluster machine, but from some kind of management machine? So in terms of watch cluster, um, there's no explicit limitation in doing so, and I believe um, that's possible as long as you can mm -hmm. access remotely into the other node as well. Um, but there's no explicit limitation in preventing us <laughs> and preventing anyone from doing so. Um, and then I, I assume the second question is related to also remotely kind of running VM fleet from a, let's say, a management node. And I, I again, I don't think there's any, um, there is definitely not an explicit uh, limitation there. Um, and it should work as is, um, as long as you have access to it um, from uh, your management or other remote node. Jeremy, there is a minus cluster parameter in VM fleet, so you can right. run in the, it new, in the new one, right? Because the old one. If the no, no, in the old one. one, it was already in the old one. Oh, really? They okay. updated it, so you can uh, use watch cluster on another node. Oh, you have to specify okay. minus cluster, and he, it will get. Because the... I did create pull request like three years ago. <laughs> and it yeah, it's like... it's it's there. Your your request <laughs> was successful, even in the old one. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so Manfred has a question. Yeah. So at uh, several points in these two days, we had the discussion that it's helpful for uh, many customers that are new to, to Azure Stack HCI and Storage Spaces Direct and these things to find functionalities and tools in Windows Admin Center, because if something is not there and the partner or the customer is not familiar with PowerShell, he maybe will never use these features. We had this discussion with software defined networking where we have seen that there are great new things and so on. Are there any um, yeah, plans to bring uh, VM fleet to Windows Admin Center with a uh, thing like um, uh, test my cluster with uh, VM fleet or something like this to have this uh, absolute easiness of uh, the graphical interface? Yeah, thank you for that question. That is a good question because that is definitely something on the roadmap as well. Um, so I'd, I'd answer this in two parts. Number one, I think um, I briefly alluded to it, but we're also trying to help customers during their initial um, ATI purchasing journey with a new sizing tool that will eventually um, be able to size IOPS performance as well. So if they're looking at a certain um, Azure Stack ATI solution, it will be able to inform them, hey, like based on your workload inputs like will this solution will be able to satisfy your needs or it won't um, but at least in the very first iteration it will be sizing for storage memory and compute and then the second part about uh, adding the vm fleet into the windows admin center is something that we're also considering later down the road as uh, we fully realize that vm fleet um, given that it's at least initially it was a bunch of scripts and using powershell um, there's a bit of a learning curve if, as you mentioned, the customer is not familiar with uh, PowerShell or any of these tools. And admittedly, we were lacking a couple of documentations as well of kind of how to get quickly get started. Um, and so with VMFleet 2.0, we also included more documentation and guidelines to quickly get started uh, with the PowerShell module. And then eventually in the future, we do want to um, convert this into a graphical user interface and Windows Admin Center is looking to be uh, one of the viable candidates to include into. Uh, great to great. hear. So I have I have another question or, or maybe a clar clarification. So VM fleet, the new VM fleet is not only for Azure Stack HCI, it will also run on storage basis direct, right? Yes, 
Correct. And I, I think at least for disk speed, it is backwards compatible until Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, and for VM fleet, it should work on Windows Server 2019 as well. Yeah, but it has to has an HCI, uh, an HCI setup, not a converge setup. You know? Because the VMs have to run on the hosts that are on the storage. Oh. Right. OK, we have a question from the audience uh, or more an um, a wish. It would be nice if there was an SDN version of VM that could stress test network config with VM to VM communication. Yeah, that's good feedback. Um, I, I think there's a couple other things that VM fleet is really lacking in addition to network, right? Um, first of all, we're using virtual machines. We aren't using containers, and so containers could be another option there as well. And mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of other things that um, VMfleet can be expanded to do in the future. And so this is good feedback. Thank you. Great. So uh, if there are more questions from uh, Helmut or Didier or Yaru may maybe have another one. Otherwise, we are done with the session and we have still 14 minutes to the next one. I still have some questions, right? So, of course, I, I, was, I was thinking about like uh, destroy or not the destroy, but the torture test that will, you know, you will run for, you know, multiple days to validate if everything is going well. Uh, somehow, if the, if the machine will, uh, if the cluster will survive everything, something like a PCS or, or was what was the name of the tool? Plot Called a cloud platform simulator, CPS, CPS tool, right? Ah. So, uh, and like a new version, and it will be, you know, using VM fleet, and inside of VM fleet, VM fleet, they would be also running, you know, some tests to torture the network, as was mentioned here, and um, then there would be another script that would, you know, be running like pulling disk or something like that, so I can have a certificate for the customer when I when I'm handing over. Uh, the solution that this solution is proved it will run as the same way as it worked in the lab uh, in the microsoft or in dell or lenovo or hp uh, where they were torturing it too just to, as a proof that yes this this is well deployed because yeah, of pcs that... i heard the pcs is just you know uh, hard to you know deploy with the vm fleet it also leaves some traces of the vm fleet you are need to create volumes it will also configure uh the policy for uh, uh yeah for the volumes that it will not you know move between the hosts so uh, something like uh, production ready before you hand it over to customer something like that yeah that's a that's a good point um i, I think the pcs is currently mainly accessible only to uh harbor vendors as that is used as a validation test into our uh, eventual catalog. Um, but it definitely is a good call out that maybe it's something that's useful for uh, future customers as well as a kind of, as you mentioned, quote unquote, torture test. <laughs> but I think maybe one step closer to that is our new measure fleet core workload as it goes through all the different workload types at different config or at different combinations uh, of characteristics. So let's say different VM alignment percentage, et cetera. And it actually performs a warm up before the run as well. Um, and um, the only downside is it does take quite a while um, along the lines of a few hours. It's still great. I mean, to have a, a Excel spreadsheet for manager so that he can walk through and see how the machines are performing. That's the thing that you would like to hand over to customer when you finish your job and to have, see happy faces of the managers that they will just show it to everyone that, hey, I have these million apps on my my new cluster and it was well deployed because I can see these million apps or something like that. But this is yeah. this is well, really good, I think. Yeah, definitely. And really, you can use that. Uh, I the result spreadsheet from the measure plate core workload to really plot out your own relationships that you're interested in as well. So if you're interested in the relationship between IOPS and latency or IOPS and CPU usage, it's a good way to see whether it's behaving as you're expecting it to behave. Cool. Uh, as part of setting up the VM fleet, I saw that you were using a script that will you know, that was counting uh, number of cores or logical processors per node divided by two. Uh, will this be as part of the documentation? Because I think this is very useful because, uh, you know, to have a, the same starting point for everyone, like assuming that you have this amount of the, uh, uh, this amount of uh, CPUs and then run this command to create VMs and run this and this and this, and it will probably, you know, we'll be able to compare with us because we were running this setup on, I don't know, 
all NVMe cluster and you got this cluster, so you should probably see the same numbers just to be able to compare it right against the some against something. So if if this would be a part of the documentation, like assume that you have this number of processor or it just you calculate with the script, run this command uh, to create VMs, the number of VMs you should and you should see around this number of you know IOPS or you can compare with us because this is the number four all NVMe cluster, something like that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, we uh, we also realized that in the past, uh, VMfleet kind of lacked a lot of documentation, um, at least for Microsoft. Um, and so within within VMfleet 2.0, we actually released um, some additional documentations on the GitHub Wiki page. And then in the past, it was just about disk speed, but there are some things about VMfleet now with example commands and also like a quick setup guide that allows you to go through a couple quick PowerShell commands to help set up the VM fleet um, deployment process for you. And within there, the default um, behavior for the number of cores for each VM is, uh, or sorry, the number of VMs for your VM fleet deployment is that the number of VMs will equal the number of physical cores that um, you have on your environment. Okay, any more questions? I think uh, we are happy now. So Jason, thanks again for the nice presentation. And uh, yeah, we will now uh, wait for another session, the last session of the day, the kernel soft reboot session. Um, so up to that, uh, we need a filler for nine minutes. Uh, Manfred, any ideas? I think we have one last question in the chat from Ben, uh, if it's okay for Of Jay course, yeah. if, it's, if there were yeah, one. Of He's asking any thoughts on using VMfleet with clusterware updating to test performance and impact of patching a cluster as an out of the box scenario. You can you can run VMfleet and patch the cluster. That works. Yeah. Done it. I even I, turn I, off some nodes and use VMfleet. I it. think the, the idea is more in the direction what uh, Jaromir was asking to, to have an automated process. Yes, you're right, you can do this and then see what, what, what the impact is, yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, for that question. I, I don't think there was anything specific on the roadmap in regards to uh, clusterware updating and incorporating VMfleet into that. Um, however, um, that is a good feedback, and I think it really comes into play of eventually VMfleet getting to the point of categorizing different scenarios, um, especially once it is once we decide to incorporate it into a, a graphical user interface. So um, maybe the future can be once you have a graphical user interface, you can then select uh, from different scenarios, right? Number one being just running through various workloads, um, as we defined here for like SQL, VDI, general, peak, et cetera. And then um, maybe as you mentioned for cluster we're updating um, as well. And then also a torture <laughs> method as well for the VM fleet. Um, so I think that's good feedback to eventually incorporate into our uh, roadmap. But you know, we're definitely not against doing that, but um, it'll it it was also not um, directly on our roadmap, but something to consider. Thank you.